I should introduce this evening's speaker, who will again be known to many of you. Um, she is most important the BAA's student and early careers rep on the council. Um, she took a degree at uh, the University of York, first degree at the University of York, an MST at Oxford, and her PhD was at the University of Kent with Emily Gary, mm -hmm. uh, looking at illuminated manuscripts of the 13th and 14th centuries in England and France. And that, I presume, provides the basis for this evening's performance. Um, she's working um, as the academic skills advisor for students at the University of York, which is a tough job. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also as a lecturer at the Department of Continuing Education in Oxford and the Center of Lifelong Learning at York. Um, Basically, she is growing into being John McNeil. I think that's oh, that's that's, that's the way I, the way I look at it. You'll 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 put on a few inches, yeah, um, over the years. Um, and her paper this evening is called "Seeing and Being Seen in an Illuminated Tractatus Moralis de Oculo, circa twelve seventy four to twelve eighty nine." Rasheen. Hello. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and. I hope I've got the audio all right. It seems really loud to me. Um, thank you for the introduction, Richard, and good luck turning off that microphone. Um, <laughs> how many PhDs does it take or degrees? We'll, we'll find out in about 10 minutes. Um, and thank you again to the BAA for inviting me to speak here today. It's a privilege and an honor um, to be here. So my lecture this evening is based on one of the chapters from my PhD thesis, which I completed last year. So very briefly, for the first time, my thesis examined a type of image that I call head initials. And in these images, figures are depicted in the confines of letter forms, looking out at or engaging with the texts and images that they accompany. In four case studies, I examined these images' potential role and function in illuminated manuscripts from France and England from the late 13th to early 14th centuries. All four of the manuscripts I looked at aim to enhance the user's spiritual growth by offering insights into divine truths and mysteries. The core questions driving my research were, what did the concept of spiritual seeing mean for medieval Christians? And how was this idea uh, expressed through the religious imagery, particularly those of the head initials? What were these images roles alongside the evolving ideas about vision and optics? And how do these reflect the lay people's um, relig um, religious aspirations and their changing reading and devotional habits? So to do this, I examined uh, simultaneously to this, the developments in theology and natural philosophy regarding theories of how we see and understand the world around us. Tonight, I aim to demonstrate how these images were more than mere decorations. They reflected the contemporary views on how people see and guided the manuscript's user in spiritual contemplation beyond the text itself. But first, let's set the stage by understanding how people of this period believed vision worked. Since the times of antiquity, philosophers like Aristotle frequently placed sight at the top of the senses. Sight was considered to play a pivotal role in the acquisition of knowledge and was a pathway to the soul. And we still use so much, uh, some of the same rhetoric nowadays that the ancient and medieval thinkers used with phrases such as the windows are the, are the eyes of the windows to the soul. Because of its elevated status, sight offered significant spiritual rewards, but also posed moral risks if misused. This made the study of how sight occurred increasingly vital for the moral and spiritual development of individuals. Toward the end of the 13th century, a French theologian based at the University of Paris called Peter of Limoges writes that, and this is the quote, if we want to contemplate the law of the Lord diligently, we are going to recognize very easily that those matters which pertain to vision and the eye are referred to more frequently than any other in holy writing. 
From this fact, it is obvious that a consideration of the eye and the things related to it is very useful in order to gain a more complete understanding of divine wisdom. And this assertion opens uh, the prologue of his treatise, the Tractatus Moralius de Oculo, um, the Tractatus or the, the Moral Treatise on the Eye was created as a preaching manual that encouraged theologians to further their understanding of visual perception and optical theories. Peter argues that this was a central way to gain knowledge of uh, divine matters. And to do this, he combined contemporary scientific optical treaties and new understandings of visual co cognition within a religious framework to, aim to aid clerics in their moral teaching of the laity. For centuries before Peter, um, there were two opposing theories of how vision physically took place. The first of these is known as the extramission theory. This theory proposed that vision occurs when the eye emits visual rays made of light. Visually, it looks a little like one of Superman's famous powers of heat vision. However, sorry to disappoint, instead of the beams being made of heat that could burn through any material, these visual rays were understood to touch the external objects leading to visual perception. And in this theory, the viewer is the active agent of vision. The opposing theory of visual perception is known as the intromission theory. By contrast, this theory claims that external objects project their own rays or visual impressions, which are known as species. This is mini bowls of fruit, the likeness going out. And so for Aristotle, light was the medium that enabled color and form to be transmitted from the object to the eye. And in this theory, it was the object that was active in vision. It was only by the mid 13th century when scholars at the universities of Paris and Oxford incorporated both of these theories into one doctrine. Theologians like Roger Bacon, uh, John Peckham, and Peter of Limoges advocated that seeing wasn't just a one-way process. Instead, it involved a two-way relationship between the object being looked at and the observer, requiring the observer's soul to actively receive the object's disseminated likeness. But what is important here to emphasize is that when, is that when Peter composed his Tractatus, he did this during a time when at the University of Paris, there were several sanctions prohibiting the teaching of certain natural philosophical works, such as those by Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. This was because there was a concern that their works were incompatible with Christian theology. And here on the screen is a fitting image of a young boy throwing books into a fire. And this is depicted in a manuscript containing Aristotle's work on natural philosophy. In his Tractatus, Peter systematically attempts to show the necessity of studying natural philosophy by using optical theory as a framework for devotional learning. For example, Peter writes that just as vision needs the soul's cooperation to take place, spiritual vision requires the soul to receive and process the grace of God. For example, when explaining how all objects emitted their own likeness, Peter uses a phenomenon known as the after image. This is a warning, there's a bright image coming up. Okay, you ready? So the after image follows the premise that if you look at something like this on the screen here for between five to 60 seconds, and then close your eyes, you will see the shape of that object imprinted on your mind. And Peter writes that this after image can potentially affect the viewer's memory and emotion, just like light does in vision, making them active participants within visionary perception. Okay, you can all close your eyes now and hopefully you should see after image imprinted on your brain, I certainly do. And so Peter compares this phenomenon to how one should visualize Christ's wounds. He writes that everyone should go within themselves and consider Christ's wounds within their mind's eye. To do this, they should imprint his wounds in their mind and soul and feel Christ's suffering. In this example, Peter emphasizes the cognitive movement from external to interior vision and the importance of the out to outward bodily and interior senses in religious contemplation. 
something very akin to the effective piety and effective images that became popular in illuminated manuscripts. The Tractatus contains 15 chapters. The first 12 chapters each begin by focusing on a specific optical illusion or theory or the eye's physiology. And this is followed by an examination of their relationship to Christian matters. The final chapters exclusively look at spiritual seeing and the divine gaze. Peter's Tractatus became a popular text during the Middle Ages and can be found in over 260 European manuscripts in the 13th to the 15th centuries. Despite the emphasis on vision, only a few manuscripts containing the Tractatus are actually illuminated. Occasionally, a Tractatus may open with an illustration depicting a theologian standing at a pulpit, pointing at his finger or gesturing upwards, um, while below a, an animated and captivated congregation listen to him, or as the example on the far left, um, a seated scholar kind of just points towards his eye or above. However, there is one manuscript I will present to you today that goes beyond the standard iconography. And this was the final case study in my PhD thesis. It is an early 14th century manuscript produced in Northern France, which because of its shelf mark, I'm being really inventive here. Throughout this talk, I'm gonna call it Latin 3234 because I just could not come up with an alternative. It contains a unified decora uh, decorative program alongside its Tractatus. In the initials of several letters, the illuminators have depicted figures in the act of looking at the accompanying text. Alongside the Tractatus, there are 22 head initials, 19 of which are men. These include kings wearing golden crowns, men wearing unusual headdresses, and clerics. One woman is only depicted and she wears a white veil. Six of the initials feature young clerics identifiable by their tonsured heads. And there are also two unusual figures who seem to be apes masquerading as humans. And tonight I will focus on five of these clerical head initials and these ape men. I want to show you how these head initial illuminations embody and encourage the reciprocal relationship between seeing and reading. I argue that these images were intentionally designed to reflect Peter of Limoges' understanding of vision as an active process. In this context, vision involved both the image and the manuscript's user. As the only illuminated tractatus of its kind, we can examine how artists captured the process of seeing alongside the text that centered on this very action. To do this, I will divide my talk into three different parts. First, I will introduce you to the manuscript in question, Latin 3234, and its likely patron. Following this, I will present how certain head initials of clerics not only depicted the manuscript's intended owner, but were designed to facilitate inward reflection. I will then turn our attention the moralizing and satirical representations of the clergy as portrayed in two very interesting head initials. Latin 3234 is a small miscellany. It contains three texts. The first is the Tractatus. This is followed by the Dictics of Cato. And finally, an incomplete version of the Book of the Customs of Men and the Duties of Nobles, or the Book of Chess, which I'm just going to call it. Two artists illuminated the manuscript. The first, whose work I will focus on in today's lecture, produced most of the initials and illuminations alongside the Tractatus, working from folios 2R to 49V. A second artist took over the illuminations, producing only two of the head initials alongside the Tractatus. This second artist's style is defined by his use of light shades of reds, blues, and browns, and his affinities with contemporary Italianate styles. As this artist only illuminates the final seven folios of the Tractatus to the end, Alison Stone suggests that this illuminator may have played a, quote, secondary uh, capacity in this book, end quote. And it's most likely that the first illuminator either passed away 
or retired or just moved on uh, before finishing it. The artistic style of the manuscript's first illuminator is characterized by small facial features, such as the tightly pursed lips, the small round heads, the long slender fingers and the wispy hair. The work of this artist is also found in two other manuscripts. And it's important to note here that in these two other manuscripts, one um, held in Tor and one at the British Library, neither contain a sustained decorative program of head initials like that in Latin 3234. And the contents of these two other manuscripts provide an insight into the types of work that this artist was comfortable in illuminating. For example, the manuscript in Tor contains a collection of moral and devotional texts in Latin, whereas the British Library manuscript comprises several Latin medical treaties. These manuscripts demonstrate the illuminator's ability to work with Latin texts from different genres, showing that he was comfortable illuminating both devotional and medical works. Both Francois Avril and Alison Stones have claimed that the original owner and likely patron of Latin 3234 was a bishop of Amiens called Jean de Cherchemont. Jean was born in Poitiers in 1303 to an aristocratic family. He had a prolific career in the church. He was a canon um, at some churches in Poitiers and Saint-Quentin. He was a dean of saint germain lox in Paris. He was bishop of Troyes for two years. And in 1326, at the age of 22 years old, or no, 23, apologies, he was made Bishop of Amiens, and he was there until his death when he was 70 years old. And apparently, this is what AI thinks Jean de Cherchemont looks like. One of the primary reasons for this attribution is the heraldry at the top, the top right-hand corner of the opening folio of Latin 3234. Here, two bird-like animals hold aloft a coat of arms. This heraldry is made of alternating pales, which are the vertical bands made of silver, which are actually quite oxidized in this manuscript, and dark blue. On, this, on top of this are red lozenges um, depicted going from the top left down to the bottom right. And a golden crozier appears in the middle of the coat of arms. And this crozier might suggest that the owner of, the, of this particular coat of arms held the position of a bishop. And as you can see here, there are some similarities with the coat of arms of the Chauchemont family minus the bishop's crozier. The attribution of Jean as the manuscript's original owner is further backed in his known support of uh, artistic patronages. While Bishop of Amiens, Jean's patronage include commencing the construction of the cathedral South Tower, which was completed upon his death, the dedication of an altar in the North Transept to three saints, and according to an act dated the 1st of June, 1370, he donated a series of objects, including precious ornaments and vestments to the cathedral treasury. Additional manuscripts owned by Jean de Cherchemont further strengthens the attribution that he was the owner of the manuscript we're looking at today. One manuscript in his collection is a 14th century pontifical used at Amiens. This pontifical is currently in Brussels. And in 19, yes, 1977, Francois Avril writes that the heraldry of the Cherchemont family can be seen on the foredge of the folios of this manuscript. The patronage of a new pontifical reveals a desire for Jean to adapt various blessings and offerings associated with the cathedral's liturgical practices. Furthermore, it would make sense that Jean would commission such a text a couple years after his installation as a bishop of Amiens. Another important piece of evidence to strengthen the ownership of the pontifical in Brussels and Latin 3234 to Jean are the artists themselves who illuminated them. As I have already shown you, Latin 3234 was produced by two illuminators with very different artistic styles. The work of the second, the more Italianate in style artist, is also found in the pontifical manuscript. The fact that these two manuscripts share the, set, the work of the same artist 
as well as the inclusion of the heraldry of the Cherchemont family, indicates that Jean, the then Bishop of Amiens, possessed both of the manuscripts. The contents of Latin 3234 also provide an impression of what Jean was interested in. As mentioned, the manuscript opens with the Tractatus, a text concerned with how optical theories can assist with the education of the laity. This is followed by the Distiques of Cato, a Latin text full of proverbs and moral lessons that became central to teaching Latin. The final and incomplete version of the Book of Chess uses chess to present the moral qualities required by each social rank in contributing to good governance. The combination of these three texts, mainly targeted at male noble readers, indicates that the patron likely wanted to enhance his sermon writing skills and deepen his religious and worldly knowledge. These works collectively make the manuscript a tool for spiritual growth, which he could then share with his audience through preaching. As mentioned, six head initials are depicted alongside the Tractatus, depicting members of the clergy. The abundance of male head initials, especially these of clerics, may also reinforce the identity of Jean as the manuscript's intended owner and audience. Even before the reader encounters any of the clerical head initials, they are confronted with what seems to be a mirror or a reflection of the manuscript's likely intended owner looking and reading the very book in which he is depicted in. Opening the prologue of the treaties, a tonsured cleric sits on an elaborate golden chair and rests his chin on his, right, um, on his left hand. With his right hand, he points in a gesture of learning at an open book on a golden lectern. He inhabits the letter S initial of the phrase C, C diligenta. Upon closer inspection, this cleric's book contains visible text. Now, if you were seated in the BNF like I was many years ago, you would have to hunch your neck over to get a closer look at this or use a magnifying glass. But luckily for you all, I have taken this zoomed in photo. And here, the small delicately written script on the page includes the very opening phrase of the Tractatus that this historianated initial opens with. C. Diligenta volirimus in legi domini. This is the same quote I presented to you at the very beginning of today. It translates to, if we want to contemplate the law of the Lord diligently. This studious cleric who reads from the same treaties as the viewer may have been what Peter of Limoges calls a perfect mirror, the diligent theologian who would benefit from reading this text. He could be the author himself, reading from his very own work, adding a sense of authority to the manuscript. Despite the absence of identifying features such as a mitre, he could also be some kind of donor portrait depicting Jean reading from this very manuscript. His golden chair could be a nod at the Episcopal throne that he would sit on in the cathedral. Either way, this figure establishes a new level of engagement expected of the manuscript's user but they too must mirror the reading and seeing of the text, just like this diligent theologian. But just as the reader was encouraged to look and reflect on the image of this opening theologian, central to the text of the Tractatus was the concern of how others may judge clerics, as well as the necessity for clerics to engage with spiritual introspection and to be wary of their self-representation. And at the heart of this was an anxiety that clergy members were often under the scrutiny of the public's gaze. In chapter six of the Tractatus, Peter focuses on a series of optical illusions and their parallels with the spiritual senses. An example is when Peter writes that fog can prevent you from physically seeing when you're standing within the mass of fog. So you can't actually see what is beyond your arm's reach. Peter explains that this is similar to when one is sinful. This sin creates a spiritual blindness like the fog, which prevents the sinner from actually spiritually seeing. Just like when a person stands in a fog and cannot see outside, the sinner does not, quote, notice the darkness of his sin, 
But once he is situated outside the sin and enlightened by the divine, uh, the glow of divine grace, he will recognize the magnitude of the sin and the mental blindness he has suffered, end quote. To prevent this from happening, firstly, you must not commit sin, pretty easy. Second, soul must actively receive God's divine grace, mirroring this reciprocal nature of how vision occurred by the soul receiving and processing the radiating likeness of ex external objects. Peter also discusses optical illusions created by mirrors. He writes that when you see an object in a mirror, the shapes of the object appear in reverse. In order to see this object correctly, Peter claims that the eye is able to judge them accordingly so that viewers know what is right is left and vice versa. While this seems odd to us nowadays, central to this discussion is the moral spiritual interpretation. For Peter, this is parallel to when one's spiritual vision is diminished. They see external matters and objects inaccurately as they were reflected against the flawed mirror um, of man's sinful nature. Basically, if you're not a good person inside, it's like looking in a wonky mirror. Everything seems confusing and not as it should be. To understand the world better, you must be like a clear, perfect mirror inside, devoid of the sinful nature that could cloud the mirror. That way you can see things correctly. And vision can be distorted when looking at material objects. For example, Peter claims that you might see these as valuable despite their non-existent spiritual worth. And to overcome such illusions, Peter says that the eye of contemplation must judge, quote, according to the mirror of holy doctrine, end quote. The first young cleric depicted alongside this phenomenon in Latin 3234 signaled that even clerics were susceptible to being deceived by reflections that could impede their moral and spiritual judgments. The cleric in this, um, in this uh, initial here may have functioned as a visual aid memoir to encourage the reader viewer, in this case, Jean, to also judge through the eye of contemplation, according to the mirror of holy doctrine. This illumination was thus an eternal reminder to Jean of how he was expected to spiritually perceive the world around him. Given that the manuscript's owner was likely a young, newly appointed Bishop of Amiens, the presence of a young cleric next to this text could be a literal stand-in for the bishop himself or young clergy members in general, emphasizing the importance of understanding the doctrine through uh, thoroughly at an early stage of one's spiritual career. Just as a cleric is in the formative years of their spiritual journey, so is a newly appointed bishop, and both are expected to have a deep understanding of the faith's teaching, holy doctrine, to guide them. But this figure may also serve as a visual reminder for the need to be constantly vigilant in maintaining one's spiritual mirror. Clerics and bishops were both tasked with understanding and disseminating the holy doctrine. Therefore, they must keep their spiritual mirrors clean, not only for their benefit, but to act as moral and spiritual guides for their community. The visual emphasis here on seeing and reading at the adjacent text mirrors the necessity for eye of contemplation to be attuned to the mirror of holy doctrine. In the next optical illusion, Peter discusses how it is difficult to determine an object's size when it is perceived through refracted rays of light. But if you were to look at the object through straight and direct vision, you could. The spiritual analogy of this is that when a sinner commits a sin, he cannot directly see the consequences or the fault but rather he sees through a refracted or oblique line, seeing only the pleasure associated with the sin itself. Peter writes that if you, want, if you want to see your sins and to understand their consequences, you must look directly at them with the eye of wisdom, uh, the eye of reason. This allows one to be able to differentiate between different types of sin. 
And it's really interesting at this part of the text because Peter scolds those clerics who are lazy and impulsive in their learning. And adjoining this part of the text is another cleric, but his demeanor is slightly different this time. Unlike the previous cleric who was intently focused on the text next to him, this figure appears more animated, pointing his index finger right, uh, of his right hand upwards. Now, I can see two potential ways of reading this image. Firstly, the animated depiction of this young cleric may have served as a vivid juxtaposition to the more calm or neutral cleric portrayed before. This second cleric may symbolize those who are lazy and impulsive in their learning, as Peter warns against. The upward pointing of the finger could represent a sort of misplaced premature confidence. Perhaps the pointed finger upwards is like a aha moment, the cleric who has hastily reached a conclusion. Without the careful consideration that comes with deep contemplation, theologians like this young cleric might be prone to errors or misjudgments. In this sense, he may have functioned as a cautionary, visionary visual tool. Just because you think you've understood something doesn't mean you actually have. Something problematic for those in spiritual leadership roles. His animated gestures are a reminder potentially of the pitfalls of impulsive learning or shallow learning and the necessity to see with the eye of reason. On the other hand, his animated posture could be a gesture of active inquiry into the text rather than an impulsive judgment. Instead of representing not what to do, he could embody the ideal state of being a spiritual leader, someone who is genuinely engaged in careful looking and rational thought. He is perpetually in the act of looking, speaking and learning from this important lesson. Alongside chapter seven of the Tractatus, the reader encounters two more clerical head initials. In this chapter, Peter focuses on different properties of the eye. This includes different eye colors, the eye's physical health, its ability to distinguish objects at different distances, and its role in receiving the species or likeness of external objects and vision. One property Peter discusses centers on the belief that the eye establishes the direction for the entire body. To explain the spiritual analogies to this, Peter uses the intermission and extramission theories. He writes that the eyes are like the lamps of the body, for they receive light externally through the process of intermission. The eyes then give back what they have obtained through extramission. Peter claims that because the eyes are placed at the top closest to the brain, they are the highest of the senses as, quote, the leader of the body, a vessel of light and the window of the soul, end quote. But the eye does not simply see for the sake of itself, but Peter asserts that it does so for the entire body because the soul, quote, shares its light with the rest of the body's members, end quote. For Peter, the spiritual lesson of this should be the same for those who have been illuminated by the gift of knowledge and they ought to sh uh, share it with everybody. Opening this discussion is another young cleric who wears a red hooded tunic. The decision to depict a clerical figure alongside this text may have to do with Peter's assertion of the importance of disseminating religious knowledge. As a religious figure, presumably illuminated by the gift of knowledge, a cleric's role was to spread divine truth. This is further emphasized when Peter later writes that clerics should be regarded as the spiritual eyes of the church who must be the watchman for the church. The accompanying clerical head initial may have prompted the reader to reflect and contemplate their responsibilities at sharing religious wisdom. The inclusion of the hood, the only depiction of its kind throughout the manuscript, may have represented a conundrum for the devotee looking at the image. The act of partially covering one's head may portray this idea of concealment of his own spiritual wisdom that is yet to be shared with his congregation. Just as the eyes are gateways to deeper understanding, 
Lifting the hood would reveal the cleric's true nature and spiritual wisdom to be shared with all. Given that a young bishop likely owned this manuscript, the image might also provoke self-reflection on his part. Is he sharing his lights of divine understanding with his congregation? Is his vision clear or is it hooded, either by ignorance or by an unwillingness to share his thoughts? In the next discussion of the properties of the eye, Peter further emphasizes the eyes as the window of the soul. Central to this belief is that the eyes can reflect a person's inner state of mind. He writes that the eyes and their movements are, quote, indicative of the secrets of the mind, end quote. And here, Peter refers to an observation made by Aristotle, who believed that excessive eye movements indicated a person's mental instability. On the other hand, if the eyes were too sluggish or too slow, this demonstrates the soul's laziness. And Peter stresses that everybody, especially clerics, need to avoid obscene and shameless spectacles as these can cloud and make their eye movement more erratic. So the necessity for maintaining healthy eyes was therefore connected to the well-being of the spiritual eye. And opening this part of the text, uh, the artist has depicted yet again another cleric. In the letter U initial, a young tonsured cleric wears a red robe. In contrast to the other clerics I've discussed tonight, who all face the text to their right, this cleric's body uh, faces out to the viewer. His lips are pursed together as if he's in the middle of speaking, yet his gaze is directed to the text on the right. This disjointed behavior where the line of sight contradicts from his body, perhaps shows him attempting to keep his eyes away from shameless spectacles that lie beyond the book. The cleric's focused eye on the text aligns with Peter's discussion about eyes revealing the secrets of the mind. His fixed contemplation symbolizes his soul's desire to learn and reflect the ideal state of a cleric's mental and spiritual focus, which the reader should attempt to emulate. This young cleric breaks the fourth wall by facing out to the viewer, perhaps a subtle nod to the responsibility of the cleric to educate his congregation, us as the reader, which is further emphasized with the pursed lips as if he's in the middle of speaking, preaching, or perhaps sharing his wisdom. But it was also a visual reminder that clerics should continually seek to improve their own religious knowledge, hence the eyes perpetually fixed on the text. As a young bishop, Jean may have mentally identified with this figure who sought to actively persuade the mind's eye to focus on divine matters. Another animated cleric is depicted alongside chapter 11. This chapter examines the seven conditions required for sight and how these relate to the education of students. To explain the necessity um, to always uh, focus on devotional learning, Peter uses the intromission and the soul's role within vision. He describes just as how the soul is required to actively judge the visual species of objects. Students must purposely focus their attention on devotional learning. Peter compares this to a hunting dog and how once they have the scent of a stag, their hunting instincts take over in an attempt to find this stag. So much that even if other stags come across their path, they seem to ignore this one and aim for the one that they had a good sniff at. And likewise, believe it or not, students should be diligent and focus on their religious education. And central to this is the role of memory, of which students must, must reflect and examine what they have heard or read internally in the cabinet or locker of his heart. The animated gesture of this adjoining cleric, similar to the previous ones discussed, suggests a form of active engagement with the material, not merely passively reading it. This aligns with Peter's notion that students must actively engage with their devotional education, just as the soul um, judges the visual species. His action of pointing is like a visual cue for the reader to pay attention 
similar to how one might underline or highlight a key passage in a text. But he might also represent the cleric's role in guiding not just the manuscript's user, but others towards the correct path of spiritual understanding, serving as a form of instruction or direction. This figure ultimately mirrors the text he adjoins, becoming an eternal diligent student. As historians, we are aware of the creation of medieval manuscripts were often a collaborative effort involving various people, such as scribes, illuminators, and the patrons themselves. While I cannot be 100% certain who decided the overall design of the manuscript, it is evident that these clerical figures were not mere decoration, but were intrinsic to the meaning and experience of the manuscript. They each appear directly connected to the text they accompany. Given that the likely owner of the manuscript was a young bishop, these figures may have functioned as idealized models of clerical behavior and duty, each embodying a different um, aspect of what it means to be a religious leader. Such figures may have served as meditative tools, encouraging deeper contemplation, self-examination, and introspection, essential qualities for spiritual growth. As a bishop, Jean would have read and looked at this manuscript, knowing that he was spiritually and morally obliged to educate himself on the importance of sight. These head initials invited Jean into the physical matrix of the manuscript to identify himself with the, in the imagery and deepen his process of devotional learning. Just as objects disseminate their likeness in the intermission theory, the text and teachings disseminate spiritual species or principles. The clerics could be understood as receiving these disseminations, which were then acquired by the reader of the manuscript. They were constant reminders of how Jean was expected to behave, understand and spiritually perceive the world around him. I want to now turn our attention to two other distinct figures. Despite their physical deviation from the clerics I've discussed, I want to show you how these figures also functioned as tools of self-reflection. These two figures are not meant to be men, but apes. Both position their faces in the profile, accentuating their ape-like figures of large nostrils and snouts. The way these head initials have been depicted resemble those in other contemporary manuscripts, such as the ones here on the screen. The first ape on the left here, on folio eight recto, wears a red robe, a hat, and has long hair. He looks like an ape trying to masquerade as a man. The second ape on folio eight verso is dressed in a red robe and has a tonsure. Compared to the preceding ape, he turns his attention away from the adjoining text on the right and look, looks upward to the space in the margin above him on the left. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth are there apes in a, uh, alongside a Latin treatise all about sight? Well, as will be revealed, the content of the adjoining text provides some insight into their design. Both of these apes appear alongside chapter six, a chapter that focuses on the spiritual analogies of optical illusions. The first human-like ape opens the sixth optical phenomenon, where Peter explains that objects seen in a mirror provide a weaker vision compared to those seen directly in person. This is because reflections are understood to produce a weaker image. Peter says that these weaknesses have spiritual analogies to those who do not correctly practice the teaching of scripture. To overcome this, you must quote, have practiced in the effort needed for good deeds before he takes up the effort to contemplate truth, for these two efforts are connected, end quote. The second ape monk head initial accompanies the following phenomenon. Peter writes how two suns are reflected when you look at a sun in a mirror placed in water. Because of this, you might actually think there are three suns, so you've got the sun in the sky and then the sun, the two suns in the um, reflected mirror in the water. When in reality, I hate to break this, but there's actually only one sun. For Peter, God's plurality in the Trinity spiritually parallels the illusion of these three suns. 
as part of the Trinity, God reveals himself as threefold and singular. At the heart of these two spiritual analogies is the potential fallibility of reflected images, which can be deceiving. Now, Peter's language throughout these two phenomena is proliferated with the repetition of the word similitario, meaning likeness or imitation. And this word was often associated uh, with apes, as the Latin word for apes is simia. In the, in the seventh century, Isidore of Seville explains that apes are called simia because they, quote, have a great similarity to human behavior, end quote. Therefore, apes were viewed as human similitude or likeness through both their physical form and their behaviors. But the inclusion of these apes in this manuscript goes beyond this linguistic parallel between simia and similitudio. And I believe that they were intended as a, as a visual form of exemplum. In the high medieval period, clerics often included short parables or exempla in their sermons. Exempla, especially those based on animals, became popular in medieval sermons with animals functioning as moral signifiers and providing satirical commentaries. Alongside their widespread use in medieval sermons is the noticeable surge in the appearance of animals in the marginalia of Gothic manuscripts. The moralizing and playful animals are portrayed as engaging in the activities of humans, such as playing music, fighting other animals or humans, preaching to one another, as well as leading hunting parties and funeral processions. Apes were also a popular feature of medieval exemplar. For example, the English Augustinian monk Alexander Neckham claims that apes were used to highlight the foolish nature of false imitation. He describes an ape who had ruined a cobbler's leather goods and had stolen his knife. Frustrated and knowing that the ape was watching him, the cobbler brings up the knife the blunt end of a knife and goes like this across his neck. And unfortunately, the ape imitates this and accidentally kills himself. So the moral of this uh, not very nice story highlights the foolish behavior of imitation and acts as a general warning that you should not pretend to be something that you're not. The moral interpretation of foolish imitating apes became a popular again in Gothic marginalia. A few examples of apes acting as priests, preaching to their congregation is seen here on the screen. As historian Horst Janssen writes, these apes functioned as quote, a symbol of mock piety, end quote. Again, in such images, the iconography may relate to the linguistic closeness of simia and similitudio, making apes act like their mirror counterparts, humans. So turning our attention back to the Tractatus, the inclusion of these ape-like men may have made the reader rethink how he judges images and first appearances. Upon quick glance, one might think that these are ordinary men. They could be interpreted as a weaker version of a devout person, just like the mirror's weaker or, or flawed reflected image. They cautioned those looking at the images and reading the text that they could fool a casual observer, but cannot stand up to closer, more spiritual scrutiny. Again, this underscores the central message of the Tractatus, the necessity for spiritual or intellectual insight to grasp the true nature of things. These two human-like apes display foolish imitations. One pretends to be a cleric, and the other masquerades as a man. They are the epitome of pretending to be something that they are not. This is similar to Peter's warning in the Tractatus of the unreliability of a mirror's reflection and the need to use one eyes of, uh, eye of reason to judge accordingly. Perhaps the reader viewer may also have been reminded that any attempt at impersonation, such as those conducted by foolish apes, only leads to spiritual failure. 
Throughout the Tractatus, Peter of Limoges consistently emphasizes the reciprocal relationship between object and viewer in vision, with viewers actively receiving and processing the likeness of external objects. In the same way, art wasn't a passive experience for the viewer. Instead, it demanded the viewer to interact to unveil its meaning. According to Michael Camille, these images had the power to stare back at the viewer, potentially transforming and affecting their soul. Images were therefore a part of this dynamic and interactive experience. The uniqueness of the decorative program of Latin 3234, made less than 50 years after the completion of the Tractatus, offers insight into the visual strategies applied to a text that had hitherto been illuminated. The head initials of clerics and apes were more than mere decoration. They served as visual reminders that guided the reader viewer to scrutinize what they saw and how they saw, and to maintain both their physical and spiritual vision. They're strategically placed next to discussions about the complexities of perception and the potential dangers of optical illusions, amplifying their role as guides and warnings. They encourage the manuscripts user to look beyond the written word and contemplate the actions of those depicted in the act of seeing. In turn, the species or likeness of these head initials were imprinted on the viewer's mind, much like the after image, guiding them in correct devotional practice towards divine wisdom. The clerics are akin to a moral compass, pointing the manuscripts user toward a life of introspection and integrity while the apes dressed as men or a stark reminder of the perils of accepting surface appearances and false imitation. The juxtaposition creates a dynamic tension, encouraging the viewer to constantly examine the, their physical and spiritual faculties of sight and pushing them towards introspection. This interactive experience is not just a fascinating part of the manuscript's design, but a reflective mirror that the original user, Jean, may have found invaluable. Thank you for your attention, and I encourage you to keep questioning, keep reflecting, and keep seeing medieval art in new ways. <laughs> I also have a shameless plug. Um, carry on with your shameless plug while I try and turn this thing on. <laughs> the shameless plug is, Put this date in your diary. We have the uh, BAA's, I think it's the fifth one now, it might be the fifth one, um, annual postgraduate conference happening uh, online again this year on the 29th of November. The end. <laughs> well, that was quite a plug. Yes. Um, you better send me a. Email oh, yeah, you'll get an email. Yeah, yeah. Email. <laughs> All the speakers. Right, good. Um, well, that was marvelous. Thank you, Thank you Rasheen. Um, I have several questions, but I imagine others do as well. Um, and it is, I will start as is now traditional with Professor Grant. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roisin. What a what, um, wonderful manuscript, and, and, and that was fascinating. But you showed some other heads, including yes. a female yes. head. And um, um, was there a bishop there or uh, kings? A king, yeah. yes. And and I just wondered how those fitted into this um, uh, this this way of helping Jean de Cherchemont to to work his way through this manuscript. Yes, well, all is revealed in my thesis, which you oh. can read at W. No, um, there, there is definite about the woman. <laughs> the, there is definite connections with the woman in the text, and I couldn't reveal uh, reveal. I couldn't include her because of timing, um, and I thought I would just focus on the idea of being a cleric. Um, but she's, from what I can remember from my research, she's very interesting because in the text, Peter discusses a lot about how women are a great example of extramission with our poisonous rays. Um, hell surprise, misogyny. Um, and so, yeah, there's a definite affinity when, when this image of a virtuous woman appears, perhaps um, kind of like signaling the, the good, respectful women who do not have those poisonous rays. 
Um, but there's a lot more to it that I can definitely talk to you afterwards if you like. Um, I quickly, easy question, looks in very good nick, this book. Yes. Did young Jean spend much time <laughs> Studying it, do you think? That's a really good question. And I think I need to do the, the Catherine Rudy style, uh, looking at uh, the corners of manuscripts to see how much they're touched. It is in really good condition and it's not actually that big either. Um, he could have just been very respectful for the manuscript perhaps, or maybe the cleanliness of it does signal not looking at it all the time. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. As, as soon he's as soon as he was twenty four, he was ready. Yeah. Rasheen, I've got a question. Yes. Um, obviously, we're a few centuries before Ogden Rude's publishing his his theory on color, but it was noticeable how often the Illuminator, um, certainly on the diligent theologian mm. page, and two of the clerics there, where they're surrounded in blue, you've got it edged against yellow gold. Yeah. But the three who are surrounded in red, the illuminator has introduced its complementary colour green. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if we can sort of say with any certainty that the illuminators had identified for themselves which colours worked well together. Oh, wow. That is a question I had never even thought of. And we actually have a few color experts in the room here, which maybe I will draw on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Complementary colors doesn't come until the 19th century. Ah, okay. So it'd be seen as anachronistic, it's with Chevreau's, uh, the law of complementary colors. And Michel Pastoreau goes on that. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're imposing sort of anachronistic assumptions. Yep, yeah, fair. I mean, it could also be, depending on where these are placed, just kind of variation, trying to stimulate the memory. If we think of like Mary Carruthers thinking about the rhetoric of memory and, and how these images can be embedded within the memory, that could be one way of alternating colors. Thank you very much, a really stimulating lecture. Um, I'm just thinking of all the manuscripts I've seen with heads in them. Um, oh my gosh. There, there are very, very many. There are, yes. And uh, uh, it's the way that they look across that is often uh, the key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've got to think about that. Uh, yes. I've got think about the apes, because I, I've seen apes in positive roles, uh, mm -hmm. playing in the Beatus initial musical instruments and things like that. So uh, there's, uh, there, are other, there are other roles for, Definitely. for them. But I'm more interested in what, what you might have to say about the eye as the mirror of the soul, because mm -hmm. This is um, not so much in art history, but in art criticism used as a basis for interpreting all sorts of works of art. Yes. And um, it seems to be some comment about when and if it, it really is a Neoplatonic thought, because everyone says it is. Yeah. But it, it doesn't seem to actually pan back to any real source in Plato. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, you, you seem to get more about the windows of the soul in Aristotle's work. That's how I found it. Um, yeah, it's a tough one because this is definitely used in the Tractatus, in, in Peter's work. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. No, no, no there's anybody, I think. Oh, okay. I, I've, often, I've often been asked, where do you get that phrase? The eyes, and, and it seems to me you've got a source here. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and actually just answering, well, not answering, uh, jumping on your first comment about they're everywhere. If you're interested, uh, one of, I have two appendices of my thesis, which actually goes through um, Alison Stone's um, volume on Gothic manuscripts and Lucy Freeman Sandler's volume, her catalogues. And it cat I go through each manuscript which has head initials. The ones I, can't, I was able to see in person or online. Um, so if you are interested, I'm more than welcome to delve into that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes. John. Um, absolutely fascinating. I'm, 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 I'm really interested in, in um, you know, what Peter Limoges thought he was uh, 
who he is writing yeah. for, because I mean I've seen it said that this is a manus this um, uh, this work is designed for preachers yeah. to help them and give them exemplar. And you talked about exemplar. I think. So I mean, is this is this um, uh, are you supposed to read this um, as a cleric and get hints for things to put into your sermons, or is it more about you know um, uh, moral transformation for the reader himself, assuming it's a male reader? I think it's both. I think the acts of getting that information to disseminate via the, the pulpit, a bit like I'm at, um, is in itself potentially transformative because of what you're reading. Um, and what I have argued in my thesis is that this text, which is kind of the crux of my whole thesis, um, it, it because it was used by preachers who then potentially disseminated it to, to, to the general audience, um, this maybe helped kind of instigate or put ideas into people, maybe who were illuminating manuscripts or working on artwork of, of how to, to see and appreciate vision in another way. And there was a really good book that came out in 2019. Um, it was co-edited by Herbert Kessler and it has writers like Aidan Kumler talking about this idea of um, how preaching work could then be manifested in art. But I definitely see this as a tool for learning, but also self-reflection, um, which is what I hope I've tried to show in this manuscript. And can I just follow up with a quick sure. one? Um, because uh, you did speak fascinatingly about you know, mirrors and, and, and self-reflection. Um, uh, none of these uh, amazing staring people seem to be looking back at the reader. Mm -hmm. um, is that significant or, or, or have I got that wrong? Are there some? Um, from the top of my memory, I don't think there are, um, which is really interesting, this manuscript, because I, in my three other case studies, we have some examples where there's one manuscript where there's, I think, 80 head initials in total and only three of them stare out. So it, it is purposeful change of design. And I kind of argue in my thesis that the text next to it uh, gives a more meaning to that. Um, but from what I remember in this manuscript, they are all looking at the text. So again, maybe playing on that form of being the diligent student, uh, which is repeated throughout the manuscript. Right, good. Well, um, thank you again, Rasheen, for a really splendid and stimulating paper on all these funny little chaps peering at their text. I should have called that Diligently. <laughs> funny um, little chaps. Yeah, I like it. Yes. Um, yeah, let's thank her again in the usual way. <laughs>